Welcome and welcome back. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, we are beginning this afternoon's uh, uh, session with uh, two speakers and a discussion. I will introduce them in a second and then we have a short coffee break and afterwards at uh, uh, 4.30 we will have a performance that has grown out of the work of the uh, uh, research collective uh, on uh, Eine Kaiserliche Botschaft. Uh, the uh, imperial message by uh, Franz Kafka. Uh, so, uh, in, a, in a way, this uh, session, which we're opening now, has its own dialectical structure. Uh, we're going to hear Galili Shachar from Tel Aviv University and uh, Esa Kirkopelto from uh, Finland, but who now works uh, at the Theatre Academy uh, in Lund and Malmö. Uh, they come from very different uh, cultural perspectives. Uh, one very much uh, here, close, looking eastward towards uh, the east from Jerusalem, and one uh, from the northern part of Europe looking uh, whichever direction you will take us into the world of uh, violence, Esa. Uh, I will uh, first introduce Galili, who is a professor of uh, comparative literature and holds the uh, Marcel Reich Ranitsky Chair of German Literature and is also the director of the Minerva Institute for German History uh, at Tel Aviv University, where he is also, since this year, the head of the School of Cultural Studies. Uh, his major contribution in research and teaching are in the areas of German, Jewish, and Hebrew study, Persian literature and culture, and he currently studies Goethe's poetical encounter with Persian and Hebrew poetry. So this is... Uh, my honor and privilege and pleasure to uh, invite Galili. Hello. I'm their colleague's friends. Uh, uh, Ruth I mean, I'm, thank you very much for the invitation. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity, you know, to repeat myself. <laughs> if one could do, I mean, say it like that, you know, to, and to share with you, with, with, you know, with such an audience of, of, of you know, distinguished colleagues and, and good friends, thoughts and Kafka and the message. And you know, I, I was asked to, to present or to present again and perhaps even to represent the, uh, the issue of intervention in, in Kafka's writings, however associated with certain messianic uh, conception of time being introduced in the Talmud and celebrated in certain Kabbalistic traditions and in the Hasidic tale. To this, however, I, I would suggest to add a short comment on reading Kafka's message, Absura shel Kafka, Kafka's message, or Da'al, Kafka's message, as interrupted by certain Sufi, Sufi tradition, namely by the concept of Tarika, or, or in Arabic and Persian, the road or, or the way, as it's reflected in the Persian poem Mantika Tayara, Conf the Conference of the Birds, by Farid al I'm, I, I would say, you know, this approach needs perhaps a, a short apology, right? Why to read like that, and what, what sense should it, what could it make? For this is not only, you know, a suggestion for a comparative reading, in which Kafka's work is being explored in a diverse context of European, Jewish, and Islamic literature, is rather the question of Kafka's nachlas, namely the efforts of reading Kafka's leftovers, both in its gravitas and its acute aspects, calling us to reconsider our own readership or our own location you know, of the gallery uh, as, as, as readers. So reading Kafka today in Jerusalem Al-Quds, in the borderlines of Israel and Palestine, in both of, you know, of the literary and the political challenges that brings us perhaps to new enterprises or attempts of studies and of scholarship engaging tradition. 
such as the Talmudic and the Sufi alongside the legacies of European modernism. So this is the, what I'm trying to offer. A Talmudic reading often refers to the imprints of a certain Hebrew Aramaic tradition. Themselves, however, were an outcome not only of an ancient Jewish scholarship, you know, like the Talmud could be imagined as, you know, as an old Jewish seminar, but also because or, or as a consequence and encounters of association with Greek, Christian, and Zoroastrian cultures in Mesopotamia. The same is to argue about the Hasidic tale that presents itself as a correction of folk tales, among them the German folk immersion alongside the Slavic and Arabic too. So reading Kafka in interventions, we one, one, so the, in all, all those traditions, as I try to present them, are active or should be reactivated in, in our reading. And this is what I call reading Kafka in, in, in intervention or in interruption. It demands a certain interruption in our own field or disciplines of studies reflecting the very idea of studium, also in its Kafkaesque, not only ironic, implication, but also, you know, ser in, in, the, in, the, in Kafka's seriousness, suggests a readership that spread into a, a, Euro spread an, into an European, a European map, but, you know, but, 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 di but differently, differently. So um, perhaps something that, I, you know, should include also <coughs> not only Paris and Berlin um, and Prague, of course, but also Jerusalem, Istanbul, Baghdad, and Shiraz, to name a few. Over such a path or a method of reading, you know, and math method of reading, it's a, you know, methodos in, in Greek is also, you know, reflecting the way, as again. So to, to study is to, you know, is, is a form of being in a certain way of life. You know, even, you know, tropes, genre are like, you know, forgotten forms of life. But it, it, need, it, need, it needs the right teacher. So um, you say in Hebrew, more derich, someone who knows the secret of strolling. A reader who is well familiar with going astray, right? So, Amorea Tov, right? Who loses his way. Such a reader, to be invited, is Walter Benjamin. This is, you know, this all long kind of uh, introduction is to introduce Walter Benjamin in, 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 in this context. In his essay, Franz Kafka to Zenten Wiederkehrer seines Todes, you know, published in 19. Uh, 34, and, you know, it, it, it is a date, right? It's an datum. While reflecting, and you know, this text is more than a text. It's essay. It's more than an essay. It's a map of German Jewish studies for many, many, in many, many uh, dimensions. Reflecting Kafka's novel Das Schloss, who just appeared in a new Hebrew translation in previous week. Benjamin reminds us about the village at the castle mountain at which Ka the Landvermesse arrives. Benjamin recalls a note by Max Brod who identified the village with a certain colony in Tirau where, where that Kafka once visited. Benjamin, however, has another village in mind and remember that and just, you know, repeat it again. So this is what Benjamin writes about this village. Es ist das Dorf einer Talmudischen Legende, die der Rabbi als Antwort auf die Frage erzählt, warum der Jude am Freitagabend ein Festmahl rüstet. Sie berichtet von einer Prinzessin, die in Verbannung von ihren Landsleuten fern und in einem Dorf, dessen Sprache sie nicht verstehe, schmachte. Zu dieser Prinzessin kommt eines Tages ein Brief. Ihr Verlobter habe sie nicht vergessen, habe sich aufgemacht und sei unterwegs zu ihr. Der Verlobte, sagt der Rabbi, ist der Messias. Die Prinzessin ist die Seele, das Dorf aber, in das sie verbannt ist, der Körper. Und weil sie dem Dorf, das ihre Sprache nicht kennt, anders von ihrer Freude nichts mitteilen kann, rüste sie ihm einmal. Mit diesem Dorf des Talmud sind wir mitten in Kafkas Welt. So, um, now, I want to say that, because what it says actually, at the end, come, I mean, Come with us to dinner this evening. It's much more important than tell you. So at the end, you know, you cannot tell this, the, the secret. So you sit together and, and, you know, celebrate Shabbat. But what is celebrated in Shabbat 
It's the fact that Messiah is still on his way. But you cannot address that or, or let's say, elaborate that in, in, in language that is always uh, a foreign one. So what to do? Celebrate in sitting together. So this is why we are sitting and celebrating Shabbat. So let's say, as I, inviting you again to, to, to this evening to a dinner is celebrating what, what, what Benny Min is telling us. So the secret of the village to which came the, 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 the princess in all the daughter of the king, and now I'm, ch I'm, I'm, I'm changing now the vocabulary, right, from, uh, from the princess to the king's daughter, is banished, and its language that she doesn't understand is that of literature. This is an argument to make. Midizem dof the Talmud zin meeting in Kafka's Welt. So at the, the, the Talmudic village become the space for locating the very idea of the literary world of Kafka. This is Benjamin's argument. And he associated the village with the body, with the uncanniness of Gregor Samsa. This is the, uh, what, what, what he argue further. However, this is now uh, my, my own intervention in, in Benjamin's uh, essay on argument on, on estrangement in, in, in Kafka's world. This, this radical estrangement of modern being that Kafka tells about associated with the messianic condition. So it's not only you know, the modernist condition of being, the estrangement um, in, you know, in Karl Marx's meaning, or in Freud's, or in Bretton Brecht's dramaturgical um, elaboration or interpretation of estrangement or of uh, it's rather it has to do with certain eschatological or inverted eschatological relationships. The Messiah, the tale tells, is on his way to save the king's daughter from the village, to redeem the soul from the body. What the princesses cannot tell but in silence is this messianic promise. In quoting the tale of the king's daughter, Benjamin creates a texture of literary expression. This is also to start with what might be called comparative literature, right? There is certain condensed texture that nevertheless deal with or relate itself to a certain reminder of, 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 of messianic tradition. So the paradox of literature, namely, how to tell a secret, to follow Kierkegaard, is also the paradox of messianic tradition. So every act of literature has to do with certain messianic reminder. The, mes the, the Messiah delivers himself in the promise of final arrival, which itself, based on permanent postponement, delays and absence in the storytelling itself. Right? So the storytelling is the space of language where the Messiah is, is being postponed. The Messiah is always here and now, yet sight, and yet not of the present, and therefore unrepresentable. You know, it's not only a play of words, it's not of the present, and therefore unrepresentable. It's something that you could ask. There's a certain futuristic dimension in, the, in this demand of the unrepresentable, but also, as I try to argue, it has to do with certain <coughs> structure of tradition. It will come today, and yet stays always, forever, on, on, the, on its way. Now, the tale of the king's daughter, which Benjamin as uh, ascribed to the Talmud, should be read also in the context of Yiddish, of Yiddish Hasidic tradition. And Benjamin's refer reference is thus, you know, it's misleading. But remember what I mean? It's not misleading that we now we scholars, we, we, we know the sources. And, and, and it, 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 because, it is, because Benjamin went wrong, we are fortunate. All right? So when I say misreading is not in, 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 you know, in the strict academic sense of the word, mis, mis, misleading in the sense of what is a more derech, what is a, a teacher. And it calls, it's related to Talmudic reading indeed. And in that sense, you know, we, and, and we follow him. And we go, you know, we, uh, and we go to, to, to search for this legend of this Agadah in a, in a, in, in, and we find something, for example, in, in a tract at Sanhedrin, Dealing with the, with the world to come, not only, it's not only this uh, uh, place in, 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 in the Bavli, in, in, the, in, the, in the Babylon uh, tradition, uh, tradition and, 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 and writing that I chose, discussing the messianic arrival, which stand in correspondence with certain, with certain time appearance in the Hasidic tale. In the Talmud, once the scholar, you know, asked about the time of the Messiah's arrival, 
they rather tell about too many, too many preconditions, procedures, and foreseeing of his arrival. So I say, well, you know, that even the Talmudic discussion itself, in telling too much, stop the Messiah from arriving. There's something in, in, you know, in the direction of study, not only the time space of the eschatological time space of, of, of the messianic arrival, but the very idea what is study is to like to say the Messiah today, but not yet. We are not yet ready. We have something yet to accomplish as what? As readers or as students. So, and this is to say that Messiah, we are told, will not arrive, this is the better way, in, in a hurry, in Hebrew, but rather in his own time, Beito. It implies a long journey, a great delay, an intervention, and you know, and the, the, the Talmud says about that, like a certain dialogue, the question, when will the Messiah come? Go and ask him himself, was the replay. Where is he sitting? At the entrance. And by what sign may I recognize him? He is sitting among the poor lepers, so he went to him and greeted him, and what would the master ask him? So what, what was the answer? Uh, when will you come? Today was the answer. So the, the Messiah, a poor and, and sick, where there is something in the, you know, there is a very perverted body in many, many sense, who sits before the gate of a great city, we read, will, will come today. Yet his arrival implies an endless intervention, and I, as I argue, an awaiting, anticipation, a promise, not a date. The Messiah stands on the threshold of time itself, and his arrival implies a radical interruption in the course of, of human history. The delay is being not yet, reveals thus the meaning of messianic arrival, the postponement of time itself, and therefore creating timeness for the, for the human. Not in vain, the messianic figure is being called in Hebrew also Akev, Akev. Also, there is a self association with the persons of Akev the, and, and, and the Messiah. Its real mission is not to fulfill the day of judgment, but rather to postpone it. Should we assume that Kafka's figures are made of this substance? There is something of, of, of a cave, right, of in, 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 in Kafka's figures. Let us, however, go back to the tale of King's Daughter, as Benjamin uh, remind us, that actually one of its sources or resources, you know, I'm not trying now to argue this is the resource, but there is something, a, a tale from the book of Baal Shem Tov, that he tells regarding the reason, the, the reason for the joy of Shabbat, as I told you already. The king's son, this is, this is in Sefer Masyot Pal Shem Tov. The king's son, it says, has been captured and there is no way of rescuing him. Years have passed until he once received a letter from his father, the king, telling him not to despair, for he will be brought back to his homeland. The king's son felt great joy, but could not reveal the secret. Again, you know, Telling a secret. This is the problem, right? This is what little church right, you know, to, to stand uh, against of. So he went with his ma with, with the men of his town to the to the guest house where they fasted and drank wine and celebrating secretly the receiving of his father's message. In this version, the one who is found in exile and waits for to be saved is not a king's daughter, but, you know. Li li should read carefully. There are certain, you know, um, gender inversion in 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 the relationship between the between the agadot between the between the stories, but rather a son. This difference again is not of marginal significance. The, gen the gender difference represents also a different interpretation of the messianic tension. Right? It's not only you know it's a daughter or a son. It's a different idea of tradition. So going from father to to a daughter, for example, or um, you know, it's 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 antigone. It's a different Oedipus, if you like, you know, to create a, a, a kind of correspondence to the, to the Greek tale, what is going on, right? It's, it's, a, it's a different, you know, uh, intervention in, 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 in the story or in storytelling or in the Oedipal condition of literature, right? It's his daughter. And, you know, the daughter is being associated as of the female figure of God, so it's also, you know, a limb or a uh, um, certain, you know, uh, ma manifestation of, of the divine body called the Shechina. And in, in both versions, the, 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 that of, of Benjamin tells and the one of, of Pal Shem Tov, both versions are based on the idea of keeping the secret. This was very, it was very important for me. Right? It's something that literary scholars have difficult 
the difficulties with, right, to keep the secret. We, you know, we're telling and, 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 keep, and keep telling and try to reveal the secret. So the, and, and here we say, you know, we learn something about literature that, that can keep a secret. And in that, fulfilling a certain messianic acceptations. So the king's sons, like the daughter, <laughs> like, right, you see, it's not like, but nevertheless, cannot tell the reason of his joy. He cannot reveal the secret of the letter, so the secret of literature. The third version that is given in Benjamin's essay should be read, however, in correspondence also with the tale of the lost king daughter by Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, that is you know, from 1815, so I will suggest immediately to read it with the, Grimm's, the, the, with the Grimm's tale. This story was first told and written in Yiddish, translated later into Hebrew by, by one of Nachman's disciples, Rabbi Natan, and published with 12 other stories in the well-known anthology, Sipore Masir. Now, Nachman's version of the tale of the king's daughter recalls the attempts of the king Vaisari, the second to the king, to find the king's daughter who disappeared from her home after the king lost his temper and cursed her. I tell that the, the uh, Aloto, right, the, the, that the, the bad guy or, or, or the evil, that is the devil, or, or, or Shed, or Isositra um, Achra, uh, um, a certain de devilish figure, um, very common in the, in the Kabbalist literature, uh, will take her. And indeed she was taken. And after a long journey from, a, from a place to place, over deserts, and through fields and forests, and you have to, you know, um, to recall that in a second, the, this very idea of the long journey, right? After this long journey, he arrived, the Viceroy, at a very beautiful, well-built and well-ran castle. Again, the castle. The vice recognized the king's daughter, now a queen in a foreign kingdom. So again, a stranger coming to the plot. He asked her, uh, how can I get you out of here? And the answer is, you cannot take me away unless you find a place and live there a full year, uh, a sabbatical. <laughs> the whole year, you should only pray and hope to take me out. And on the last day, you should fast and not sleep the entire day. And so he did. However, on the last day of that year, on his way back to the castle to free the king's daughter, the viceroy saw a tree with very appealing apples. He picked one, ate it, lay down, and slept for a very long time. And the king's daughter was not rescued. The story, however, continues. The viceroy again fails in his attempts to save the queen from her castle. He now goes back to the desert in which he searched many years for her, looking for a mountain of gold and castle of pearls. There he shall find her. And indeed, eager and dedicated to saving her, he finally arrives at the gate of a beautiful city. Remember, like the, like the, the, the Messiah himself? He bribes the, the gods to let him enter the city, something that, that you know, the Kafka before the, the, uh, before the law didn't recognize. The, you know, the opportunity to bribe the god. For he will need to stay there some time. So he entered the law, or entered the city. It will require many wisdom to free her. Yet, how he freed her, he didn't tell. But in the end, he freed her. <laughs> so the, there is an act without a way of telling it. So it's not the vice, no, it's not the vice who speaks in the end of the tale. There's a change there. But rather, Rabbi Nachman himself, the storyteller, leaving, however, the tale unresolved. The story of saving the king's daughter is not told to its end. So it's not about the viceroy. It's about Rabbi Nathan himself who, who never find an end to his own tale. Right? So no, not, you know, Rabbi Nathan, so the translator, right, the disciple, discussed the tale in, in, in allegorical meaning, in Kabbalistic terms, and it's boring. According to him, the loss of the king's daughter is an expression of the matter of being after the breaking of the vessel and the fall of the female divine body into the death of evil. So it's the allegorical hermeneutic circle. And prayer and good deeds, it tells his readers, may save her. The real messianic tensions lie rather in our view, and I'm telling our view, if I can quote Vivian when Kafka says we, what I'm meaning here, in our view when we say yes, uh, is in the interventions of the tale and its failures, digressions, detours, disorientations, and getting lost. So the, the, the key is not you know, in, in only in, in, in saving or solving the tale, but rather in moving back to the rhythm of, of interventions. Saving the princess, resolving the tale, signifying a messianic end. But the tale of the king's daughter refuses to attend an end, right? But not in the, you know, in the, in the open, 
uh, not, not only uh, saying it's an opening, there's a, there's a, as I said, there's a certain seriousness in this openness. The message is still on its way, and the king's daughter, one should assume, is not in a hurry neither. She is not yet willing to return home. So there is a refusal of her to be saved. Right? There is also a tension to be addressed here. She doesn't like to return home. One recalls in this context Kafka's story, The Kaiser Shebolchev. What, what a tour to, to talk about what you just invited me to tell. Telling on the long journey of a messenger who carries with him the last words of his sovereign. The short story published in 1919 should be also, it's, you know, it's very standing you know, very close to the of the gallery. Yeah, it uh, um, uh, should be also read in the context of as a fragment of Kafka's longer story by Mbao the Hinesian Mala. This is how I, I try you know, to, to offer you such a reading. And so the old story, it's not only you know, the fragment on, on the Kaiser Shebolchaf, but uh, the story by Mbao the Hinesian Mala is very important. The story tells on the great unfinished enterprise of building the Chinese wall which was left, like, like Kafka's own story, as a great fragment. The story tells also on the Chinese emperor who lives in Peking. About him, one hears a great many things, but can gather nothing definitely. The people of the land who live in the south, uh, f far from his residency, know too little about him. They are like those newcomers, strangers in town, studying in a side street, peacefully munching the food they have brought with them, while far away at, at, the market, at the market square, the execution of the ruler is taking place. It's, fair. it's, it, it's a cruel, you know, it, it's about political violence too. Right, to this, the storyteller now adds finally the tale on the message from the emperor, known also the, as the Geiselish Botschaft. The messenger, a kräftiger man, a powerful man, is sent by the emperor while lying on his deathbed, carrying him with a message to you, his most humble subject. The messenger set himself on the journey. His efforts, however, seem in vain, for the multitudes are so vast. So many chambers should he go through. So many courts he will still have to cross. More stairs, more courts ahead, and once more another palace, and so on for thousands of years. And if at last he should rest through the outmost gate, but never, never this happen, the imperial city will lie before him. But there, read, no, nobody could find his way through even with a message from a dead man. You sit, however, at your window when evening falls and dreams it to yourself. This is where there is a correspondence between what you just performed. Many contexts, several implications, double ironies can be associated with this story, in which, like in the Hasidic tale, the very idea of telling a story, the matter of literature, is questioned. Yet, if the message which is never to arrive properly, even not in conjunctive form, should be understood as of messianic value, it's not because of its imperial origin. It is rather the idea of, of, of the way, or better, the roads, or the umwege, the detours, the endless journeys of the messenger that provide the story with its mess not only messianic uh, horizon, messianic source. This way, full of obstacles, is associated with false acceptations, hopeless hope, as one can say after reading Kafka or Benjamin on Kafka. The readers of Kafka's story, as those of the Hasidic tale, are still waiting desperately and therefore not without hope, right? So not, des not uh, desperately and therefore not without hope. The interventions in Kafka's world, the long path, the road, unknown, the postponement, the delay of the messenger, we argue following Benjamin's hint are of messianic values. Those interruptions create not only a space for reflection, which is very important, a condition for observation and of critical review, what is the meaning of uh, perspective, again, of the galerie, but rather they signify the matter of being, or as I argue, a way of life in Hebrew, derech, in Arabic, Persian, al tarika Messianic is thus a road that the readers are called to take, like the readers. So, like the messenger in Kafka's story, they are doomed to endless roof, inversions, and great degradations. Now, I'm coming to, my, to the end of my story. 
The idea of the messianic state as an intervention reflecting the way, or as I argue, academically, the method, or how, you know, how search is important for, for every research, as an inversion or a detour or a long path, recalls a Sufi poem by Farid Adin Attar, as I, as I mentioned, The Conference of the Birds. A major notion of this poem is indeed reflecting the very idea of, of the way. The spiritual journey of the souls tested purified before joining, merging into the divine state of being. The poem tells about the conversation of the hot hot, the hope, with the birds who serve as their, as their guide you in the journey to the Simarg, the divine marvelous bird. The way, however, is long and devastating one. They travel, I'm, I'm quoting, they travel on for years. We read, a lifetime passed before the long for goal was reached at last. But the road itself is left as a secret as we read what happened as they flow, I cannot say. So there is a, it is a trope, but it's more than a trope because there are many stories told in, in Mantik Atayar, many, many stories told there, but the stories are, what they are doing, they interrupt the journey because while they tell a story, they stop. The, the assembly of the birds are coming and hearing the story, and there is a debate about the moral of the story. And this is why there are uh, many, many years on the way, because of what literature creates, right? It creates an intervention. So the world itself is literary, but in that sense. Only a few birds, it says, survive the way. Some dip within the ocean depths were drowned. Some died on mountain tops. Some died of heat. At last, at the gates of the Simarg pa Palace, who refuses, refuge, uh, refuses to, to welcome them. Right? The birds, 30 in number, acknowledge that they themselves, once they were free from the self, from the ego, are to compose the Simarg. In Persian, this, this, this name or this word implies also 30 Bird. So only the assembly create the mirror image of the Simorg that is of divine figure, right? So the moment when the Simorg uh, itself disappears, it creates the opportunity to those birds to reflect themselves as what? As the missing Simorg. It's the same word. However, not only the story of the journey, which itself is told rather short, right? I mean, the, the story about the journey is, very sh is given in a very short um, way in, in, you know, in, in, in Atar poem. It's all about the way uh, to the palace and why literature itself or, story, or storytelling you know, create an interruption and hold them back. The conversation of the birds consists of anecdotes on Sheikh and, and Dar Vishan, the Sufi protagonist, in which the matter of the road is being associated with drunkness. Remember how they drink in the Feast of Shabbat? Uh, state of ecstasy in Persian masti, so we drink you too much, you, you, can't, you turn into a, 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 into a masti, and with devotions of love in Persian Arabic eshk. Those protagonists are doomed to a long journey and difficult trails. Like, uh, uh, like the second to the king in the Hasidic tale, they suffer impossible trials, the tests of love. One of the anecdotes tells on the watchman in love just like, one, like, just like the Viceroy in, Bre in, 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 in the Breslov tale, fails his test. At night, as his beloved arrives, he was already falling asleep. Remember what I, as we read? The beloved left him a message. So there is a message in the, in the story itself that tells about messianic messages. Another message written by the princess in, that, that says, right, uh, sleep is unworthy of the lover's name. So the real lover never slept. And you no, know, the sleepless days, as we read further, nourish the observance of the world. And a similar concern, you know, we recall, is related to the nar and to the fool in Kafka's story, uh, Kinder of the Landstrasse, another story on what is a way. The Sufi conception of tariqa stands indeed for different matters. In many of its versions, it implies an intervention in the course of being, radical reformation of the human condition, founding in renunciation, renunciation of the self, and um, right, in German, and in the deconstruction of the economy of being itself. The major Sufi figure, the Darvish, a poor man, 
homeless embodies the sorrow of love in which his devotions to God are being shown. This figure who renounces normative forms of life and goes even beyond the religious love or beyond the legal conception of Islam interferes the very idea of sovereignty and stands often against the sultan, the ruler. So there is something you know, in the relationship to the sovereign that are not without importance when we go back to with Kafka, the Kaiser Ishebotchev. So the Darvish is being portrayed as a beggar, remember the messianic figure in Talmudic uh, uh, anecdote, sitting at the corner or before the gates, awaiting. This figure, again, uh, also returning re in the short stories of Saadis Golestan, so there's a certain tradition of, of Darvishan in the Persian, classical Persian poetry, where this, this figure in, in his, his semi pseudo messianic uh, protagonism returns. So in, 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 in different work of Persian literature, hints also at the melancholic state, of course. So the renunciation of the self, or even a ma masochistic interpretation of desire, but also a higher poetical conception of being what I try to argue, keeping a secret. So reading those stylized Sufi poetry and prose in correspondence with the Talmud tale on the Messiah, a poor man who sits at the gate, the beggar, who becomes of the prominent protagonist in the Hasidic tale that Benjamin's used in order to reveal a certain messianic tension in Kafka's literary world, this is the chain, may serve as another detour in our readership, and this desperate, perhaps, hopeless, reflects the idea of hope in Kafka's world. So to conclude, may I have another two or three minutes, or it's, it's fine? Can we bear another move? Yes. How do you mean? You know, it's, it's like, no, you know, I'm, I'm not the saddle. <laughs> no, because it's, it's turning to a bother, you know. So the, uh, the, okay, so the, the debate, I'm, I'm, I'm moving now back to the Sifria, to the, to the National Library. I'm, I'm very aware where, where we are sitting or standing. The debate regarding Kafka's manuscript being kept in Max Brod collection charged the question of Jewish nachlas with different, or, um, with re-urgency. Kafka's writing and drawings were recently delivered according to an Israeli court decision to the uh, possession of the National Library in Jerusalem. The heuristic procedures the public and the public op opinion evokes not only the, uh, someone, you know, the, uh, uh, something like the, the false question to whom Kafka belongs, but also uh, initiates anew the question of the archive, of course. The question where Kafka's writings uh, belong to, whether to the public domain or the uh, private ownership, whether to the German National Archive in Marbach or the Jewish National Library in Jerusalem, covers, as we know, the real issue of what is Nachlas, namely the question regarding its unexpected readership. The futuristic as aspects of, of literary heritage depends on the rise of new contexts of reading. This is an argument to make, in which texts are unfolded beyond the fa uh, familiar schemes of interpretation. A reading that is different, to follow you know, the Talmudic term of the Varacher, is based on chains of contradictions revealing hidden potentialities of life and of meaning. How such reading correspondence with Kafka's writing? Right? This is still a question I'm asking. How should we re reorienting ourselves, how should we reorient ourselves in engaging its leftovers here? Once we tend to engage Kafka's, it's not an answer, love the tone, it's not an answer, right? Once we tend to engage Kafka's left over reflecting the question, what is left of Kafka for Europe today or for, for the Middle East or for Jerusalem Al-Quds, we recall also the recent misplacement of his legacies in Israel. A reading of Kafka cannot deny this, the, those recent debates on his Nachlas. Kafka's unfinished novel, so his old work, it should be understood as an unfinished novel, is read also in the shadow, not only in the light, but in the shadow of an Israeli court decision, because we know what, what is the meaning, the political work of an Israeli court decision. Reading Kafka's writing, again, once they are understood as Jewish nachlas, is attached also to this conflict zone of Israel and Palestine, referring to the tension between the Hebrew and the Arabic. Reading Kafka to their response to efforts of, you know, of, you know, of creating a domestic understanding uh, perhaps a false attempt of nationalizing the, the Nachlas as a correspondence with certain enterprising of globalization of authorship, which is also bad. <laughs> so it's even beyond the contextual readership of world literature. Right? 
a contemporary engagement with Kafka's Nachlas demands also, you know, not only reorientation, but, you know, losing your way. Namely, thinking of and from the, the borderlines between East and West, that is also the different matter of every European enterprise. Again, there is no one way, you know, there is no proper way to explore literary corpus, but rather different method had, that involve, as Kafka's own work shows us, detours and dead ends. So reading Kafka begins with attempts of reorientation, which implies no solution for his right, for his, for, for, for his, for his secret. A Kafka reader, if there is something like a Kafka reader, like, his protag like, like Kafka's protagonist, is still doomed to effects of vertigo in terms of reading limping or, or getting lost as, as a reader. And the study of Kafka's leftovers calls for, you know, imagination also of, of a new readership. And, you know, you, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself here. A new continent, perhaps, a new Euro-Asia, a map of reading that spread between London and Paris, Berlin, Istanbul, Jerusalem, al quds Cairo. In such a girl poetical space, its coordinators are neither Western nor Eastern, or even not only Northern and, and, and Southern, Kafka's legacies are to serve as a substance of political thinking in which Europe and the Middle East are brought together, you know, not, n not in terms of being together, brought into, you know, into a thinking, into a thought. You know, I want to end with a question. What such a reading would bring about? Thank you very much. So I want to introduce Esa Kilkopelto, a philosopher, artist, researcher, and performing artist and he currently works as a professor of artistic research at the Malmö Theatre Academy, uh, belonging to the University of Lund in Sweden. Previously, he worked in the University of the Arts in Helsinki, and he is also a docent at the University of Helsinki. And he is a leader of a collective research project, Actors Art in Modern Time, on the psychophysical actor training. Uh, and his research focuses on the deconstruction of the performing body, both in theory and in practice. It's a pleasure to have you here, Esa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Freddie, and thanks for all of you for being here. Um, in this paper, I will approach, approach the question uh, of interruption as a relation to the notions of freedom and free will. I will work with three different but interrelated testimonies, testimonies on the topic coming from Kafka, Franz Kafka, uh, Friedrich Hölderlin and Immanuel Kant. An act of will, if it can be considered as free, clearly influences, uh, introduces in the course of events a new starting point. According to one definition of Kant, the transcendental freedom, in other words, freedom as it conceived from the point of view of theoretical reason, consists of, I quote, an absolute causal spontane spontaneity beginning from itself a series of, series of appearances that runs according to natural laws. Is from the end of the first critic. As one can immediately notice, this definition confronts freedom with the course and uh, course and causality of the nature. Of nature, according to Kant, this confrontation leads to an antinomy, as he calls it, that he famously solves by proposing that human reason conceives all the beings, all the phenomena in a double, uh, all the beings in a double register partly as phenomena following the categories and laws of the empirical reason and as noumena following at last instance the moral law, the famous categorical imperative. I would now like to contrast this classical dispos philosophical disposition with an aphorism by Franz Kafka. Uh, and this aphorism uh, uh, was initially found in his notebooks from notebooks from 1917-1919 and uh, published in a series of remarks and aphorisms titled by Max Broad as Betrachtung, Betrachtungen über Sünde, Leid, Hoffnung und der Wahren Weg, Reflections on Sin, 
pain, hope and true way. It's a very short one. It goes as follows. From a certain point on, there is no return. This point, this is the point to reach. Von einem, einem gewissen Punkt an gibt ein keine Rückkehr mehr. Dieser Punkt ist zu erreichen. The statement consists of two phrases. Its sense uh, depends much on whether we are supposed to know what it says as a matter of fact or whether its contents rather constitutes a matter of faith. If the latter were the case, one actually should read it as uh, there must be a point from which on there is no return anymore and we should reach that point. And that is how some inter uh, translators have translated it or in that direction. Since the first phrase now, now very laconically or prosaically states that from a certain point there is no return, I assume that the phrase is a constative concerning the general state of affairs in the world. However, if we read it like that, we face immediately a paradox. How do we know that unless we have already reached that certain point or have seen someone else reaching it? The certain here translates gewissen, which literally means the known or the acknowledged. As a known, das gewissen also means moral consciousness. Is this, fra uh, is this phrase now speaking of empirical or moral consciousness? What makes it interesting to me is to suppose that it speaks, uh, that it speaks of both of them. On the one hand, a conscious beings, as conscious beings, we know that in each singular case in our lives and in history, there is a certain point after which there is no return anymore. This piece of knowledge can evoke in us hope as well as fear. In any case, the first phrase of the statement tells us that the course of the world contains irreversible moments. This is an empirical fact. It is only the second phrase that provides a statement with, its, with, with a more moral tone. This is a point to reach. It neither says that we should solen reach it or that we must reach it, mussen. It only states that that point is reachable and reaching of that state is, or at least can be, something desirable. The, but, uh, the particle zu here keeps all these options open and this openness may be of importance now. If the reaching of that point is desirable, then there is also something hopeful in the statement. The phrase can be read as a promise. There is a point that can be reached, you can reach it, and that would mean something good for you and for us. But that reading is neither a necessary nor the only one. We are free to put our hopes on this opportunity, in which case we can only rely that it carries us forward towards a positive and desirable goal, but we are not obliged to do that. That's where the question of freedom enters the play. We can now continue questioning and ask what makes us free. My hypothesis today is that it is that same piece of knowledge that ultimately makes us free. We are not dealing here with a, possi with a possibility among others, as if we could think that, okay, let us those who are interested in changing their life or the way of the world to do that. No, the possibility in question is not just an option. Instead, in so far as we are provided with this innate knowledge, it can also constitute a moral precept. It can constitute a formula of liberation where freedom is defined in relation to what is not free in the course of our life and in our history. A free act consists of conducting the state of things up to the point after which they can irrevi they irreversibly change their character or order. Now the empirical knowledge and moral, moral knowledge, unlike in Kant, do not exclude each other anymore but are intertwined. But this entanglement also entails obvious risks. It entails that this both morally and empirically conscious being has in some way always already reached that fatal point and that her certainty concerning this very possibility derives from a transgression that she has already committed through and by her mere being conscious. 
In other words, the human consciousness has been born as a result of something that since the ancient times has been called by hybris, and that in English may be translated, for example, as wanton, violence, insolence, or outrage. Hybris as the very possibility of human reason, uh, freedom and its worst threat, as our hope and as our peril. This is what the German poet philosopher Friedrich Hölderlin, soon after the Kantian revolution, recognized as, the gu as a guiding principle in his theory of the tragic dramaturgy. And that's what I'm going to speak a little bit next. Like all the young poets and philosophers who in the, late, uh, uh, in, in the later history, retrospectively, have become famous as representatives of the early German Romanticism or idealism, also Hölderlin was strongly informed by the, informed by the philosophy of Kant. In a letter to his brother dated the 1st of January 1799, Hölderlin called Kant significantly as the Moses of our nation who leads Germans out of their spiritual lethargy and stagnation, I quote, into the free, solidary wilderness of speculation. However, this intellectual veneration did not prevent him from criticizing uh, the, uh, Kant either. Like in the case of Friedrich Schiller, who introduced the young poet to the Kantian philosophy, to, to, to the, Kantian philosophy the critic raised from the point of view a poet and a playwright who sought ways for readjust, readjusting the goals of modern poetry and dramaturgy in the intellectual landscape redefined and transformed by the Kantian philosophy. In Hölderlin's case, his mi mi major confrontation with Kant took finally place in the field of dra tragic dramaturgy, and there, in particular, as related to his attempt at the beginning of the, of the 19th century to translate Oedipus Turanos of Sophocles in German. According to Hölderlin, the suffering of Sophocles' last hero were unprecedented, unprecedented different from those of all the other ancient heroes. With this finally blind hero, a modern experience was born in the midst of antiquity. As the poet explained in a text accompanying his translations uh, entitled Remarks on the Oedipus II, to which Freddie al already mentioned in his opening talk from 1804, the modernization of Oedipus's tragedy does not pre presuppose major changes of the tragedy at the textual level. In that respect, Oedipus the Tyrant distinguishes itself in a fundamental way from Antigone, which was the second, second of the Sophoclean tragedies translated by Behelderlin. One need only consider Oedipus from a, pers from a new perspective that would render manifest the particular solitude of its hero. In this perspective, Oedipus' tragedy would seem to be the testimony par excellence of the beginning of or birth of the modern experience and uh, as a lesson of its innate hybristic and hybristic character. What did, did the hybris of Oedipus consist of? The answer Hölderlin gives in his remarks on the Oedipus is twofold. The first one concerns the logic of the hamartia of Oedipus, and the second one, its metaphysical sense. First, as Hölderlin expl explains, the error of the hero relates to his misreading of the oracle of Delphes concerning the reasons of the Blake that ravages in the city of Thebes. And here it is, unfortunately, now only in English as translated by, by Thomas Fowl. This is from Sophocles. It's from the, the reply of, of Creon to the, to the questions of Oedipus. In plain words, has Phoebus commanded us the king, one shall ex expurgate the country's disgrace, nourished by the soul, not nourish the incurable. This was the text that uh, 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 Oedipus, according to Hölderlin, misinterpreted. What does he do, Oedipus, in front of these oracular, oracular words? Instead of behaving like a modern statesman who aims at, according to Hölderlin, carrying out a severe and pure trial and maintain, ma maintaining a good civil order, Oedipus interprets the saying of the oracle 
according to Hölderlin, in, in a priestly fashion and too infinitely, zu unendlich. First, by having recourse to the really religious rituals of purification, religious purifications. Secondly, by associating the cause of the disorder with the unresolved murder of Laius, the previous king of Thebes. Thereby, as Hölderlin continues, Oedipus ends up to, I quote, interpreting the general injunction in particular terms and taking the sin as infinite. At this point, Hölderlin co Hölderlin's conclusion is deliberately Kantian and modern. For him, the excessiveness of the first Oedipus does not lie in, in involuntary offenses, but in the hero's incapacity to, to keep hold of, it, of his modernity. That is to say, to be modern enough in front of the mythologizing interpretations and thus, sta and thus stand firm in his political judgment. At the decisive moment, rather than contenting himself with his institutional status, Oedipus resorts to a more archaic and sacrificial order and tries to find a scapegoat to blame for the social disorder. The hubris of Oedipus thus constitutes the starting point of the tragedy. Its turning point, peripeteia, or catastrophe, the change of fortune from good to bad, which in the tragedy of Oedipus significantly coincides with the anagnorisis, the recognition, takes place a bit later, but actually much earlier than what the poetics of Aristotle had once proposed. Unlike what Aristotle suggests, the turning point, the, this turning point is not caused by the messenger who brings the news about the death of Polybus, the presumed father of the hero, and who simultaneously re reveals that the latter Polybus was not the real, not uh, that uh, was not Oedipus, uh, uh, that that Oedipus was not a real son of Polybus. Instead, as Hölderlin stresses, the revelation took place already in the dialogue with the blind seer Tiresias, who clearly announced that I quote, "The man whom you long for, lo uh, the man whom you for long have searched, threatening and pro proclaiming Laius' murder, he is here." Why the right location of the Peripeteia is so important here for Hölderlin, since it is the point where the contents of the play coincides with its dramaturgical structure. For Hölderlin, the recognition and the turning point should not result from the reasoning of the protagonist him himself. Instead, these two factors derive from the structural principle of the tragic dramaturgy, its calculable law, as Hölderlin, Hölderlin calls it. Calculable, gesetze. According to that law or calculus, the very idea of the tra tragic dramaturgy is to produce a certain point. Uh, uh, is uh, the very idea of the tragic dramaturgy is to produce at a certain point a crucial and irreversible change of perspective, which concerns both the protagonists and the spectators of the tragedy, the whole of the tragic presentation or mise en scène. That particular, particular structural moment, Hölderlin calls Zesura, Zesur, as we have already referred to, a counter interruptive, uh, the counter rhythmic rupture or interruption, a pure word, that shifts our attention from the change of representation, from the dialogue to the representation itself, Vorstellung selber. In the case of tragedy, this manifestation has a particular meaning as compared to other modes of poetic presentation, namely its emptiness, from which derives its both separating and purifying function. It leads us to consider the, this leads us to consider the second aspect of hybris, namely its metaphysical sense. Let me quote the definition of Hölderlin for the tragic catharsis here. Uh, the presentation of the tragic rests primarily on the tremendous, das ungeheuer, ungeheure, how the God and man mate, and how natural force and man's innermost boundlessly, and, and man's innermost boundlessly unite in wrath, conceiving of it itself, on the boundless union purifying itself through boundless separation. 
Die Darstellung des Tragischen beruft vorzüglich darauf, dass das Ungeheure, wie der Gott und Mensch sich paart und grenzenlos die Naturmacht und des Menschen Innerstes in Sorn eins wird. Dadurch sich begreift, dass das Grenzenlose eines werden durch grenzenloses Scheiden sich reinigt. I'm not really convinced of this English translation. But anyway, here it is. This twisted structure of the phrase is in my mind due to the simple fact that in it the human experience tries to grasp itself. It tries to seize what happens to it at the moment of the tragic catharsis. This sich begreifen is in, uh, is in, in this sense uh, something quite important, which no, has no real place in the phrase, <laughs> because it somehow depicts everything that happens in that phrase. In that event, the experience conceive, uh, conceive, conceives of its own hybristic character, how the relation between God, that we can consider as the divine power of nature, Naturmacht, or physis, and human being, uh, how this relation is a presentational relation, a double bind which is dependent on the historical techniques, on the historical techniques of representation, and for that same reason is cons constantly susceptible to the excess of representation, and maybe, therefore, because of that, to hubris. This excess, this tremendous, das ungeheure, or deinon, consists of a tendency to suppress the openness of the fundamental relation between humans and the divine, and turn against them and violate both of them. This is what Hölderlin means as he characterizes the interpretation of Oedipus concerning the oracle as two unfinite, in, uh, in, other fight, in other words, not finite enough. In the modern situation depicted by Hölderlin between the humans and what they are not, the power of nature, there is no pre-established pre limit, like in the more ancient times. In this respect, the human existence is essentially boundless, grenzlos. Instead, there is a relation which is threatened by its own conditions of possibility and which therefore has to be constantly regulated, uh, 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 regulated and uh, purified by us. Instead of the transcendental illusion warded off by Kant, we encounter here a possibility of the transcendental crime, the modern mode of hubris, which both at the individual and collective level has always already engaged our experience. Just like Oedipus, at the beginning of the play, we, the moders, moderns, his spectators, have from the very start overstepped our limits. We have gone too far or stepped beyond. Transcendental means, transcendental, the word that Kant introduced, used, means that transcendence has become an affair of the human beings themselves. Spiritually, the modernity means nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less. The way the tragic dramaturgy engages the experience of the spectators is based on the same excessiveness. Isn't it significant that at the outset of the tragedy, the hybristic nature of the misinterpretation goes as unnoticed, not only for the protagonists, but for also for us, the spectators of the play? And isn't it strange that at the middle of the play, we can become uh, surprised by the cesura over again and go through the corresponding affective purification, even though we know the plot of the play by heart. These kind of simple facts betray, betray not only that our experience is cesured and interrupted from the very beginning by and through its own structure, but also that that constitutive interruption and transgression is implicit and hidden by the seeming coherence and continuity of our experience. A certain forgetting is therefore here prevailing and constitutive. For the same, reasons as, con uh, for the same reason as conscious, conscious subjects, we never learn. Let's now move to Kant. Do you have those handouts I, I asked that Okay, Adi will distribute them to you. 
So now comes the most difficult part. I hope you still have some patience to listen to me. This, at mo moments it's a bit technical, but I can promise it will be quite surprising in the end. <laughs> <coughs> All this so far has been more like introduction to what follows. As I uh, mentioned a week ago at the occasion of my se seminar presentation here at the Institute, the philosophy of Kant plays a very special role in relation to the topic of our research group, the interruption. One of the uh, objectives of Kant's critical project was namely to establish a coherent, continuous, explicable and predictable idea of the human experience which would provide a reliable basis for an empirical and moral conceptual determination. That is also why uh, Kant aimed at change away or eliminate all the radically, in other words, transcendentally interruptive elements from his, from his system of knowledge. To begin with the free will which like mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, had no empirical status or mode of appearing. Correlatively, the modern or modernist need or urge for interrupting, for interruption, the idea of good or necessary interruption, which uh, also undoubtedly, undoubtedly motivates our work here, returns historically to this Kantian starting point and deserves to be assessed in relation to it. What to do with the mode of experience that is dominating the modern era, the experience which has turned too objective, too technical, too distanced in relation to all beings, like or unlike us? What to do with the excess of representation and technique due to which both our common and individual worlds have, have become too coherent, homogeneous, continuous, predictable, instrumental, prosaic, alien, desert-like. What else can one do? What else can we do than to try to make an interruption in the dominant and in the end violent order of things to break it's all, they're all too, in the in to break the, the, the all too integral, integral facade and widen those breaks through which we as individuals and collectives could reach a more existential, corporal, poetical and less violent contact with everything, with our fellow beings and species. This was a mode of reasoning that was born in the aftermath of the Kantian revolution, a philosophical ethos that was simultaneously aesthetical, political and religious and that ever since has informed Western thinking up to our days. And we here are also the heirs of that tradition, I think. In respect to the birth of that tradition, the genealogy of the tradition, in retrospection, retrospection Hölderlin uh, seems like playing a definite, uh, 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 an important role as one of its initiators, as he and one of his initiators, as he in his uh, uh, remarks on Oedipus, tended to indicate how the modern experience was bor born hybristic and how the conditions of possibility of the Kantian experience could turn against themselves. Showing this, indicating this, requires that one, open with, that one opens a new perspective on the human action, no matter if that action were practical or intellectual, doing or thinking, and that perspective, as we have already noticed, is essentially scenic. If we agree, like I propose that we do, that the Kantian analysis, to a large extent and still today, manages to summarize the modes according to which the modern we, as modern empirical subject, conceive and articulate our relation to what we are not, to the efficient reality, wirklichkeit, then the question re remains, to which extent that analysis, this Kantian analysis, mainly presented in the first critic, is finally susceptible to the Hölderlinian deconstruction. My ne next task is therefore to indicate the moment in the Kantian discourse where the hybristic interruption in question happens in particular and how it happens. 
one of those moments, since there are many of them, resides undoubtedly in the third critic in the chapter entitled The Analytic of the Sublime, where Kant discusses the type of sublime he significantly calls mathematical. But, as we will see, see soon, the topic also involves certain passages in the first critic concerning the theoretical reason, concerning the workings of the transcendental imagination. The mathematical sublime it, uh, covers the special area of aesthetic reflection in which the impressive effect of a phenomenon is based on its great magnitude. We face something immense that, that it impresses us. That is nothing beautiful, it is something else, it is sublime. The case is thus different from uh, empirical judgment where a phenomenon to be measured, if you think about its size, uh, is, may continue limitlessly and regardless of the scale of human perception. It is crucial in the sublime experience that the phenomenon to be observed is not too big, not too small, not too distant, not too close, such that it can challenge these intuitive scales of measuring. This borderline or subliminal situation brings human cognition into contact with the claim of me measure within it, which Kant identifies with the power of reason itself. In the mathematical sublime, the imagination fails to represent the magnitude of the phenomenon and thereby indirectly communicates the power that keeps on requiring a positive result. This aesthetically and perceptually unsatisfied claim is finally compensated by the un unimaginable idea of the absolutely large or infinity as a whole. At the same time as the observation of relative quantity changes into an aesthetic idea of absolute quality, the empirical process of measuring confronts its aesthetic parameters. The empirical process of measuring confronts its aesthetic parameters. This is expressed explicitly in the first passage of, uh, of this analytic of the sublime, mathematical sublime, paragraph 26, from which I pick up uh, two phrases. Estimation of magnitude by means of numerical concept, simply act of measuring, or their signs in algebra, numbers, is mathematical. Estimation of magnitudes in mere intuition by the eye is aesthetic. We can immediately notice that things have certain kind of size, they have a certain kind of volume. And, and, and that's an aesthetic way of conceiving the, them instead of, I think, I said that, estimate that this is about 20 centimeters long. In other words, all estimation of the magnitude of objects of nature is aesthetic. In other words, determined subjectively rather than objectively. But these two modes of uh, uh, mm, estimation work together in order to give us uh, the empirical uh, phenomena uh, the way they, we, we conceive them. Uh, magnitude is intrinsic intrinsically linked to the capacity of a phenomenon to pre present itself as an... Okay, let's, let's go. Stay, hold the horses. Magnitude is, intri in magnitude is intrinsically linked to the capacity of a phenomenon to present itself as an entity with a certain unity, which does not yet make, I uh, which, 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 but it does not yet make of it a conceptually determined empirical object. It's a kind of preliminary operation conducted by imagination, after which only can conceptual, conceptual determination can take place. The instance of faculty in charge of fashioning sensorial influence into perceptible data, Kant calls transcendental imagination. This faculty has a double role. At times, it works in the service of theoretical understanding. At times, it appe appeals aesthetically to the subject of taste. In principle, the two kinds of judgment, theoretical and aesthetic, should never be confused. This is at least what Kant seems to propose. However, a closer reading of the descriptions of the analytic of the sublime 
complicates this divide in an interesting way, as we will soon notice. The functioning of the transcendental imagination in both critics is namely, so what we are basically do if this feels like hard, we try to imagine how imagine, imagination works. Nothing else, nothing less. And that's why it's difficult, as you can Im imagine. Uh, the functioning of the transcendental imagination in pr both critics is namely understood as an interplay between two concomitant processes. So imagination's operation is actually twofold, and it consists of two processes, first of them being apprehension, auffassung, apprehensio, and comprehension, zusammensetzung, or comprehensio aesthetica. Apprehension follows the and I will now show you this. I will comment this more later. But I imagine it, that this is what Kant basically means. There is a flux of events completely undefined. And apprehension follows the flux of phenomena and packs, packs the cognized sensory material to perception into an unending temporal and associative series of data that comprehension in turn recollects and gather, gathers into recognizable phenomena. In other words, unity is susceptible to conceptual determination, such as empirical objects, or, aesthetic, or for aesthetic reflection. This imaginary elaboration of the sensible this imaginary elaboration of the sensi sensible data starts already on the level of the pure intuition of time, insofar it constitutes our, as Kant call it, Kant call it internal sense, and consists of the auto-affective production of instants following each other in an irreversible order. No sequence of time or special perception reaches human understanding without this kind of fundamental imaginary freedom. <coughs> Let's observe now, according to Kant, uh, how imagination operates in the case of measurement. <coughs> in order for the imagination to take a quantum intuitive, intuitively, so that uh, we can then use it as a measure or unity in estimating magnitude by numbers. <coughs> the imagination must perform two acts, apprehension, apprehensio, and comprehension, comprehensio estetica. Apprehension involves no problem, for it may, for it may progress to infinity. But comprehension becomes more and more difficult the farther apprehension progresses and it soon reaches its maximum, namely the aesthetical, aesthetically largest basic measure for an estimation of magnitude. My, my, uh, supposition resides, uh, my, my argument resides now on the supposition that this comprehension is same in the first critique, in the theoretical uh, working of, of the sensorial data as in the aesthetic, uh, aesthetic judgment. Uh, I hope I'm right. Uh, anyway, if this holds true, the sublime experience is therefore attributable to a certain crisis of comprehension. Comprehension is problematic because it only can see uh, a certain amount of, 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 of data at one time. What does this crisis imply? Let's continue to follow Kant's, Kant's analysis of the sublime experience as focal and and focused on the transcendental, transcendental scene where Kant literally tries to imagine how the imagination works as it gives a phenomenal unity and totality to our representations. And now you can take a look at your handout because the text was too long for really for being read. It's, there's, you almost have a sublime experience where crushes goes over the human capacities, so you can read it on the, on, the, on the handout. Measuring as a way of apprehending a space is at the same time describing it, and hence it is an objective movement in the imagination and the progression. It's already quite a paradoxical thing. 
on the other hand, to comprehend a multiplicity in a unity of intuition rather than of thought, and hence comprehending in one instant what is apprehended successively is a regression that in turn cancels out theta, the condition of time in the imagination's progression and makes simultaneity intuitable. So in order to grasp this donation in a, uni in a unified form, you want to actually in, in need to move against the, the direction of time. That's what comprehension does. Hence, since temporal succession is a condition of the inner sense and of an intuition, it is a subjective movement of the imagination by which it does violence give out to the inner sense. And this violence must be the more significant the larger the quantum is that the imagination comprehends in one intuition. Hence, the effort to take up in a single intuition a measure for magnitude requiring a significant time for apprehension is a way of presenting for Stellungsart, which subjectively considered is contrapurposive, but which objectively is needed to estimate magnitude and, and hence is purposive. And yet the same violence that the imagination inflicts on the subject is still just purposive for the whole vocation of the mind. He considers stimulus humorous. A detailed analysis of this extraordinary passage is impossible here. I just back pick a few elements that are most relevant from my argument. The mathematically sublime experience, the temporalizing operation of the transcendental imagination is dependent on two concomitant operations, apprehensive and comprehensive operation. Whereas apprehensive imagination continues, continues to count the time faithfully without caring where it leads, this movement leads, the comprehensive imagination simply, uh, finally and simply runs out of time as it tries to gather the immense, in, immense magnitude into one intuition. This situation has two important consequences in the depiction of God. First, the result of comprehension, their simultaneity, zoom like sign over here, consists of a compressed or reserved time. This is compressed or reserved, a restored time. Uh, secondly, the violence gave out the comprehension had hence all the time done to the course of time, not only now becomes apparent and turns against the imagining and sensible subject, the mind, thus Gemut itself, who feels like being torn by a violent and destructive tension between the massiveness of sensorial do donation and the unf unfulfilled demand of the totality and unity. At this critical point, the imagining subject simply throws in a towel. And what happens? Against all expectations, no one will be crushed, destroyed. The experience does not fade, but from now on the representation continues as if by itself, independently of the effort of the sensible subject, as sustained by the overall structure of, of the experience, the reason, which in this way may manifest its superiority over the subject and everything that the subject can encounter in the phenomenal world. At that same moment, the violence itself changes its signification, even, <coughs> though, even though the German word Gewalt remains the same. Violence, Gewalt, that the subject first suffers from, changes into a superpower, Gewalt of the reason, that the subject, which is now deprived of its intentions, enjoys. This is how we are used to understanding the structure of the sublime experience, except that now we have also become better aware of the way it concerns the totality of the Kantian experience, the theoretical and empirical experience included. What uh, this quoted, uh, this long passage reveals is the agonistic and hybristic scene. It's a theory, in my mind, on which the unity and totality of our everyday and empirical experience is based even though it remains concealed, and that's the whole point. Even though apprehension and comprehension, the main protagonist of the scene, always seem to collaborate, their relation, as a matter of fact, is always implicitly violent, insofar as the comprehension tends to suppress and gather 
aufheben, the preliminary work of the apprehension that faithfully tends to follow the course of the sensory donation. Uh, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, therefore, this operation does not only open a constitutive gap between the apprehensive donation and the comprehensive appropriation. So, constitutive gap over here. Uh, mm, but it also hides this gap from itself and forgets it constitutively. So, the comprehension does not seize its own, uh, own movement either. It only, what, what it only, at the end, what we only see is this kind of pizza. <laughs> and we are satisfied with it and ready to eat it. Mm. But all that <laughs> work and violence uh, has been forgotten and left remain concealed. This gap which uh, thus has seizured and interrupted our experience preliminarily and implicitly has no ch a chance to manifest uh, has no chance to manifest itself except in exceptional cases of which the sublime experience constitutes one major ex example. At the sublime moment, the experience makes uh, an experience of itself. An experience makes an experience of itself, like also in this in the moment of catharsis, of its innate hybristic nature, of the fact that it is all the time at its limits. If this is the case, why can't never say by himself? Am I only here stretching or forcing the limits of his discourse or distorting his initial orientations? Not necessarily. What I have just outlined does not exclude the kind of conclusion Kant himself draws from his analysis. It is nearly fairly possible to interpret the sublime experience at every occasion and over again as a manifestation of the triumph of reason, of the victory of the nominal world over the, over the phenomenal one, like Kant actually does. You re remember the end of the, the second bit. The moral law in my heart, deep in my heart, the star, starry guy above my head. But if we take this it, but if we take his uh, uh, analysis carefully, a la lettre, it is possible to understand it more deconstructively and in a more finite way as a manifestation how the relation of human experience, how the relation of the human experience to the efficient real reality is to be conce conceived as a result of the way, way or art of representation, Forstellung's art, like Hölderlin calls it in his remarks and that, strangely enough, appears also in this quoted passage. In the first case, that of Kant, the violence that imagination suffers from is transcendentally necessary and dictated by reason. In the latter case, that of Hölderlin, the violence in question loses its necessity and becomes a very matter of our transcendental concern, concern and care. Like it does in the tragedy of Oedipus, whose outcome in this, in, this, is, in this respect is finally not tragic at all, or rather anti-tragic. It is tragic if we accept that, OK, violence is necessary, and we, ha we have to do violence. But that's not the outcome of the, of the, of the tragedy. We, we notice that there are, there are violence, but we can do something for the violence. We don't need to accept it. And that's an anti-tragic uh, attitude in my mind and more than one, sober one, prosaic one. Changing the world does not imply its subjugation to the eternal human, but also the transformation of the human itself. Uh, dismantling of the violent domination of the modern bourgeois subjectivity implies that we also are ready to become truly liminal beings. Or as Kafka puts it in his aphorism, where all I have said is expressed in the most condensed form <coughs> one can imagine. From a certain point on, there is no return. This is the point to reach. This is the point to reach. Thank you.
I will have a few, but you know, bring it back into the sort of Germany, Germanistic or German mm. study issue, you know. Mm. We have Kant and the, the issue of theater, mm. even, even you know, the thing of certain attempts in really the third critique mm. were misleading in many sense, mm. not only Gerdelin, mm. also Schiller, mm. Kleist, mm. but they were constituting the making of the German theater. Mm. So really Kant was a point of departure, you know, with all the ironies of that. Why to read Kant you know, mm. in, in the theological scheme? Mm. Not only a theoretical approach, but also yeah. you know, point of departure in Kleist's mm. case, also in her that, you know, leading the field of philosophy mm. to something else that tend to be the literature as a refugee. Mm. Again, with you know, concealing those tensions, not only the theory of the, mm. the sublime, but, you know, and then the body reappears, and you know, questions of measure, time, and, and space reappear. Yeah. Different versions. So, so there's a gesture. I, th I thought it was a, a certain gesture in German studies to move back to Kant mm. as in recreating a condition of thinking, mm. and the failure. So not reading Kant or moving back to Kant is a starting point for mm. certain history of theater. Mm. So I and when I did the second one. You know, Einstein to be in one, because mm. you mentioned her that in, in, in you know, the critique of, of any prospects or critique, mm. I mean, the, really the condition of, of, of the mm. tragedy. There's certain, you know, the being, the being together of, 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 the, of the man and the divine is an Einstein. There's something in the, in the Kantian, you know, this epistemological disaster, so to say, in the sublime has to do with such an attempt mm. of bringing into the one, mm. right? So again, there is a failure. I you know that Kant doesn't think tragic, tragic there, mm. but something of the experience, the epistemological uh, experience of, of the subject of the sublime, the subject of the sublime, had to do with such an attempt, right? It's something of trying to reach something, to be in one with God, right? mm. or with the sublime, mm. that creates a sort of echo but back for it, right, to your to your reading of her. So there was little, I, I, I saw the tensions. It's not just to argue about the same mm. in both cases, right? Mm. Uh, that can turn into you know an, an old text in in that in that you know in thinking about Cesura, in thinking about the the theological approach in around eighteen hundred that, that were not solved in your lecture. But whether we're hinted to, see what I mean? They were like flooding a little bit, but you, you, you know, you didn't draw them together, but it, they stand, they, they stood, or they, they, they stand there. Um, so my question won't be now try to regather those moments, but whether reflecting that uh, again. Mm. Well, uh, I, I think. May, may relate to, 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 to religion and, uh, and uh, religious uh, ambitions and spiritual ambitions. Uh, what, what, uh, and uh, and uh, in Hölderlin's case, there was a real uh, experiment that preced preceded this one uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Sophocles, namely his attempt to write uh, this, this uh, tragedy, modern tragedy, on the death of Empedocles. And it failed, and uh, what came out uh, there is a kind of autocritic, autocritic that the, that the uh, you know this Empedocles who throws uh, himself into the crater of Etna and tries to become a god, and uh, uh, there, this is kind of a, a warning, a counter example that if you try to become god, you are torn apart. Don't get too close. Yeah, don't 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 get to this. Uh, this Happen to become one with God, to be, become, or uh, mm, mm, how to say, uh, yeah, is 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 doomed to, to to this kind of counter, to to doomed to separation, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what to what to what to say, what to say more. Uh, so let's mm. yeah. let's let's give Paul the word. Just a quick question to you, Galileo. You said something really um, enticing. 
and I wonder if you could elaborate. You said at some point in laying out this landscape of the Messiah, or whatever you would call it, messianic um, delay, that there's a kind of story, maybe from the Talmud, in which someone would act without the story that would explain it. Do you remember saying this? Could you say more about how that works and where it comes from and how you see that related to the Messiah problem? Right. You know, I, what I try to do is not a, a certain conversion of the Messiah tension into literature. It's not, it's not an attempt you know, to, to solve the Messianic question with its theological, religion, alachi, you know, surrounding, communal, liturgical, so the work of prayer, to say, you know, what is left for us is now dealing with literature and its modernists. It was not my attempt, mm -hmm. although it seems to be, what I tried to relocate in the realm of literature and storytelling, and now come closer to us, question, is in what sense there, there is certain unsolved there, or an openness, which is not an empty one in, in, in modernist terms, it's also, you know, future, which is liberal, or that is, <laughs> or letting go. But there is certain tension, traditional one, which is not, which is not solved yet in tradition itself, right? And I tried to, 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 you know, to coin that back with what, with, as a secret, right? So what, what I mean with secret, so it's, it's, it's already in literature, it's already there, it's already in the, in the cause and even of storytelling, right? It's like, you know, gathering and what literature is doing, let's tell a secret. But there is something that doesn't let itself be being told. And this tension is, what I, I try to say, is part of the messianic idea. Okay, so certain tension in the body of the messianic tradition is literary in that, in that very sense. So it's not only the modernists enfolding that, but whether it's already there. Because always they tell a story about the Messiah. Or, right, it's already a literary corpus. And I try to maintain the tension with what arguing about secularization mm. or about mo the modernist condition, but, but arguing something about the secret, right? And how to tell, and in that, that, in that case, not only to reveal that, but keep the secret in telling about it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 no, Wait, first uh, you have to refer to Nicolas and you. Yeah. You want to react to that? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you both of you for your very inspiring um, uh, contributions. I have a, a maybe one question which relates maybe the two of yours. Which is, um, I'm, I don't see yet really why, uh, Isa, why you were talking about a forgotten violence. Because, I mean, in Kant, uh, the, the analytic of the sublime is all about um, the, the impossibility uh, to have desire without uh, the lack of desire, lust, unlust. So it's a mixed feeling, in a way, the feeling of the sublime, mm -hmm. which is to say, despite the fact that there is this sublime experience, which is a kind of triumph. Uh, on the one hand, it's also a kind of defeat on the other, and it's therefore mm -hmm. this, what Kant calls a Widerstreit, so not a contradiction, but a kind of, um, uh, well, what's Widerstreit in English? I don't know. Different, whatever. Put. Different. Different, I know, it's, it's yeah. this, uh, Lyotard, Joseph, different. Yeah. Um, so, so now, uh, maybe the point where there is a relation to, to Kafka would be that for Kant, the most striking example for the sublime um, is of course uh, the sublime law uh, you shall not uh, create an image right, um, yeah. and and of course the ka, ka, uh, well the, 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 the continuation of that is this uh, broken sentence do so still can will so Kafka not ending the sentence uh, into the fragmentation, the the fragmentation turns into a textual fact. So, so, so it, it's not even the sentence that you get. So you don't even know, uh, well, you're not supposed to create an image, but it's rather you're not supposed to, uh, not, you're not supposed to create an im, so you're <laughs> stuttering, so to speak. An image. A bill. Uh, so it's, it's no longer a business. It's, it's, it's uh, interrupted at the, yeah. that moment by Kafka. So it's yeah. a questioning of the very fact that we know what we are supposed not to know. 
consideration about the uh, well, let's, let's speak about yeah. Protestantism and Reformation uh, instead. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean Erdelin will learn in Tübingen Stiftung yeah. as a Christian theological seminar, and, and he, but also learn ancient Hebrew mm. and, and Greek both at the same time. So mm. I, I agree with it. But, but you know, the interesting as, mm. as always are the differences and mm. where did those, those mm. the synthesis uh, collapse. Mm. This is to go back to the question, you know, did Eric Auerbach argue the same? May I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric Auerbach argued the same, Nicholas, when he argued about the, that the fragmentation of the, of, of the, of the Hebrew Bible, <coughs> the, the Old Testament, is like corresponding the prohibition against the making of, 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 of an image. So he argues about something that you know, happened in the in the frame of the image is like translated into the textual frame. He's doing a bad job. But you know, the, the argument is there, and it's it's there also in the sense you argue about that. Mm. There's a certain Judeo Christian tradition, Protestant ones, so to say, not only, however, where it seems that they come, came very close, as if there is also a, a common ground for both traditions. However, it's not without anti Semitic discourse of that time, around 1900. It's not without the Zionist attempt, because they were, at least Kafka, were also there. It's not without the Hebrew attempt, no, it's not. So also without what? And attempts of, you know, of uh, departure mm -hmm. from, from the European Christian model of Judaism. Mm -hmm. They don't without moving to Andalusian mm -hmm. images of, of, of what Eastern Jew, not only Austrian, but rather the Swahili Jewish Yes, me. So there is a different dialectic that you know, and I, I, I try. You know, my lecture was a little bit into that. Let, let's go <laughs> it out a little bit, not in order to move to a, to another civilization, right. to the Islamic one. Mm -hmm. It won't solve anything. Mm -hmm. But right, in order to to deal with the difference between the Christian and, 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 and Judaism, because this is what I think is what is left for us, mm -hmm. or what, also not to let it <coughs> stabilize itself into what religion is, mm. right? Or, so in order to keep them separated, in order to ask again the question of what Christian or Christianity means, rather, mm. right? rather than solving that or define it well. So there is a certain act of resistance, I would say, mm. you know, not only from Kafka to Tzela in losing the Jewish moment, you know. Martin Heidegger, when he went back in his lectures on the Easterus and Herdalins, and he tried to correct what the philosophical Hebrews is that? The Das Ungeheuer and Das Unheimlichkeit. Unheimlichkeit, right? Unheimlich. Unheimlich. And there he brought back, in the 40s, the Jewish question. Mm. But in a very uncanny way, mm. right? So, in, again, and this is a cesura, if you like. Mm. Not yeah. only in, yeah. in epistemological terms, but in, yeah. in the history of, the, of this oh. uh, imagined civilization. Yeah. Yeah. What do you agree? Mm. Well, probably yes and no, yes and no. I, I don't like the generalization of the Hulderlinian uh, uh, notion of Cesura because he only used it in this analysis, in this particular analysis of tragedy. And, uh, and uh, it, it has, uh, in other political contexts, in other political genres, the situation is already different. This relation is not separating. It's, uh, it's only separating and purifying in tragedy, but elsewhere it is something else. And that maybe leads to, to my point, namely you were speaking all the time about messianism. I didn't speak about it. I had it, I had it in mind. If I had another, another hour, 45 minutes, I could have ended up to, 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 to say something about messianism as well. For me, it, it, it relates to something, to, to, to well, 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 I actually have two, 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 two things. Well, first of all, you know, all your stories, all, all those people who, 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 all those um, protagonists, uh, they, they worked really hard. They did something they did not only uh, wait for. <laughs> they went through trials. And they, they, they actually, this working, uh, this kind of uh, ascesis they went through, was part of the, 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 the story and the teaching. So uh, it's, it's not just that I wait for until the Messiah, Messiah sure. comes, but the meeting is always at the midway. This is the Messianic work. Right, yeah. right. The midway. And that is interesting. And uh, that may have some resonance with, with what I'm doing. It, 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 it relates to the question of body, that, and, uh, and I don't know what, what is the what, what role the body 
funny place uh, uh, in, in, in Junaik and uh, thinking in, in Christian thinking it, uh, it's, it's the most crucial it's one of the most crucial ones and uh, but but anyway the Messiah in, in certain uh, um, texts as well as I know it, it, it comes through a gate it needs a gate and for me that that gate is the sin is the yeah, yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. let me round up because we're, yeah. we're beginning to find the. Yes, it comes from over here. Yeah. Yeah. From over here. <laughs> this side. Okay. Yeah. I, provoke, provoke you a little. That's how I think. I, 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 I found this extremely interesting and I want to thank you both. Mm. I think it was interesting because. The question is how to reach that point when there is no return mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in both cases. And I think the roads that you, you started with in the Kafka aphorism is to, to reach that point. Mm -hmm. That's, and I, I, I read your uh, explanations or your, your discussion of Hedlund and then of Kant as, as a way of of uh, uh, sketching that road which leads to the place of non return. Mm. And it obviously is very much connected to Hebris, mm. uh, which and to give out. And give out not only as as violence but also as power. Yeah. yeah. yeah the the, the, the other part of give out which which we usually yeah. in English uh, uh, disregard, the mm. question of power or an empowerment. And I, I, I think that, that, for me at least, uh, Galilee's uh, uh, explanation is how to find a story that will justify, or how to create a story that will justify the fact that we will never reach that point, or not in our time, as, as uh, we, we won't believe in that, that the Messiah will come, but not in our time. So that that but not in our time needs a story, but but the the attempt to reach that point from which there is no return and maybe we stand in front of the gate not only of the law but also of the Messiah, which is I think also in Kafka's case of the uh, in front of the law is a story about facing a theatrical stage of some kind where the law is enacted in its full glory, but yeah. we are not allowed to see it, of course, we only see the little light coming out, the glance coming out but, through the door, but, uh, but, uh, be, uh, behind the door. But, so, so I think that, that that leads us to a point where there is perhaps a, another form of commitment which is not the, the, the Jewish one, but which is maybe a Christian one. I yeah, but don't as, know. Yeah, but as, as you said, Gavin, you said at some point I wrote it down, Kafka's figures are made out of this substance. Yeah. So they are figures which are made out of certain substance. Right. Right. Yeah. They are, they are, right. for me it, it means that they are some sort of bodies which has a messianic potential. There is a quote. That, that's, what, that's what interests me in this option. In this, in this option. I, I agree. I mean, but you know, after this talk you can also say Kant. You know, you ask me, who is Joseph Kant, right? And what does letter stand for? Kant, right? I think one of the contributions was not to forget this philosophical tradition. And Kafka was not a, a very bright Kant reader, so to say, but there is something in the philosophical tradition uh, in its, at, at its edge, at least in the, in the third of the sublime, that makes Kant, you know, creating another sign in, this, in the riddle. Mm -hmm. 20th century literature, who is mm -hmm. Ka, but what mm -hmm. does that stand for? But beyond the irony, I do agree that there is also, you know, an endless, you know, dealing with Christ corpus in the time. Mm -hmm. In different in different matters, right? mm -hmm. which are not only Protestants or Catholic, it's, you know, it's, it's different. As to the different perception um, of the Christian early story. Mm -hmm. But let yeah, leave it on like, uh, a quick last comment. Yeah. Uh, I think Ivan uh, means force in the apprehension to a form. It means in Hebrew you would say rape of the shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, the failure of sublime is uh, exactly 
when this whole story is generated from the failure, what uh, Heidegger said, the second beginning. You, you fail, you retreat, and uh, as uh, Hannah Arendt said, old Denken is not Denken. So if you want, you have to start the second beginning, which is a Christian idea for you. Mm -hmm. So let me end with a corner story. Uh, so they ask, somebody comes to ask, Brecht's Ka, Koiler, what are you doing? I'm preparing my next mistake. <laughs> okay, so we have half an hour coffee break, I think downstairs. Yes, downstairs, coffee. Thank you.